But I wanted to ask you about this comment that you made, that the Republican Party, you said, is the most dangerous organization in world history. Can you explain? Has there ever been an organization in human history that is dedicated with such a commitment to the destruction of organized human life on Earth? Not that I'm aware of is the Republican organization, I hesitate to call it a party, committed to that overwhelmingly. There isn't even any question about it. Uh, take a look at the last uh, primary campaign. Uh, plenty of publicity. A very little comment on the most significant fact. Every single candidate either denied that what is happening is happening, namely serious move towards environmental catastrophe, or there were a couple of moderates, so-called uh, Jeb Bush, who said, maybe it's happening, we really don't know, but it doesn't matter because fracking is working fine so we can get more fossil fuels. Uh, then there was uh, the guy who was called the adult in the room, John Kasich, the one person who said, yes, it's true, global warming's going on, but it doesn't matter. He's the governor of Ohio. In Ohio, we're going to go on using coal for energy, and we're not going to apologize for it. So that's a 100% commitment to racing towards disaster. Uh, then take a look at what's happened since. The uh, uh, November 8th uh, was the election. Uh, there was, as most of you know, I'm sure, a very important conference underway in Morocco, Marrakesh, Morocco, uh, almost roughly 200 countries at the uh, United Nations sponsored con uh, conference, which was uh, the goal of which was to put some uh, specific uh, commitments into the uh, verbal agreements that were reached at Paris in December 2015, the preceding International Conference on uh, Global Warming. Uh, the Paris Conference did intend to uh, reach a verifiable treaty, but they couldn't uh, because of the most dangerous organization in human history. Uh, the Republican Congress would not accept any commitments. So therefore, the world was left with uh, verbal promises, but no commitments. Well, last November 8th, they were going to try to carry that forward. Uh, on November 8th, in fact, uh, there was a report by the World Meteorological Organization, a uh, very dire analysis of the state of the environment and the light likely prospects also pointed out that we're coming perilously close to the uh, tipping point where which was the goal, of the, the goal of the Paris negotiations was to keep things below that, coming very close to it, and other uh, ominous uh, predictions. At that point, the uh, conference pretty much stopped because the news came in about the election. And it turns out that the most powerful country in human history, the richest, most powerful, most influential, uh, the leader of the free world, uh, has just decided not only not to support the efforts, but actively to undermine them. So there's the whole world on one side, literally, at least trying to do something or other. Uh, not enough, maybe, although some places are going pretty far, like Denmark, a couple of others. And on the other side, in splendid isolation is the country led by the most dangerous organization in human history, which is saying, we're not part of this. In fact, we're going to try to undermine it. And we're going to maximize the use of fossil fuels, could carry us past a tipping point. Uh, we're not going to provide funding for, as committed in Paris, to uh, developing countries that are uh, trying to do something about the climate problems. Uh, uh, we're going to dismantle regulations uh, that retard the uh, impact, the devastating impact of uh, production of carbon dioxide and, in fact, other 
dangerous uh, uh, gases, methane, others. Okay, so the conference kind of pretty much came to a halt. Uh, the question, it continued, but the question was, can we salvage something from this wreckage? And pretty amazingly, the countries of the world were looking for salvation uh, to a different country, China. Here we have a world looking for salvation to China of all places, when the United States is the wrecking machine that's threatening destruction. In the, with all three uh, uh, branches of government in the hands of the most dangerous organization in human history. And I don't have to go through what's happened since, but uh, the, uh, uh, in general, the cabinet appointments are designed to uh, assign to people whose commitment and uh, 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 beliefs are that it's necessary to destroy everything in their department that could be of any use to human beings and wouldn't just increase profits and power. And they're doing it very systematically, one after another. Uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has been very sharply cut. Uh, act actually, the main department that's concerned with uh, 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 environmental issues is the Department of Energy, which also had very sharp cuts, particularly in the environment-related programs. In fact, there's even a ban on uh, posting and publishing information and material about this. And this is not just at the national level. Now, the Republican Party, whatever you want to call it, has been doing this at every level. So uh, in North Carolina, a couple of years ago, where the legislature, mostly thanks to gerrymandering, is uh, in the hands of the Republicans, uh, there was a, a study, uh, uh, they called for a study on the uh, effect of sea level rise, on what sea level rise might be on the North Carolina coast. And there was a serious scientific study uh, which uh, predicted, uh, not, I forget how many years, not a long time, about uh, roughly a meter rise in sea level, uh, which could be devastating to eastern North Carolina. And the legislature did react, namely by passing legislation to ban any actions or even discussion that might have to do with climate change. Uh, actually, the best comment of this, I uh, wish I could quote it verbatim, was by Stephen Colbert, who said, uh, if you have a serious problem, the way to deal with it is to legislate that it doesn't exist, problem solved. You know, uh, this, this is going on all over the country. And it's not just, uh, it's not simply uh, Climate change, that's bad enough. But there's a, another huge specter that we're kind of uh, trying to survive under, and that's nuclear war. And that's a whole other story. Here, both the Obama administration and increasingly Trump are uh, radically increasing that danger. Uh, this, the threat of the uh, particular, of, of the new developments is captured uh, very effectively in the best simple monitor of the state of the world established at the beginning of the nuclear age by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. I'm sure you all know about this, but the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists regularly brings together a, a group of uh, scientists, uh, political analysts, others, very serious people to try to give some kind of estimate of what the situation of the world is. The question is, how close are we to termination of the species? And they have a clock, the doomsday clock. And when it hits midnight, we're finished. Uh, end of the human species and much else. And the question every year is, how far is the minute hand from midnight? Well, in, at the beginning, in 1947, beginning of the nuclear age, it was placed at seven minutes to midnight. Uh, it's been moving up and back ever since. The closest it's come to midnight was 1953. Uh, 1953, uh, the United States and Russia uh, both exploded hydrogen bombs, which are extremely serious threat to survival. 
uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles were all be being developed. Uh, uh, this, in fact, was the first serious threat to the security of the United States. There's an interesting story behind that, but I'll put it aside unless there's time to talk about it. But then it came to two minutes to midnight, and it's been moving up and back since. Uh, two years ago, 2014, I think it was, the uh, uh, analysts uh, took into account for the first time something that had been ignored, uh, the fact that the nuclear age, uh, the beginning of the nuclear age coincided with the beginning of a new geological epoch, uh, the so-called Anthropocene. There's been some debate about the epoch in which human activity is uh, drastically affecting the general environment. Uh, there's been debate about its inception, but the World Geological Organization has recently determined that it's about the same time as the beginning of the nuclear age. So we're in these two eras in which the uh, possibility of human survival is very much at stake, and with us, everything else too, of course, living, all living, most living things, which are already under very severe threat. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2014, the bulletin began to take that into account and moved the minute hand up to three minutes to midnight, uh, where it remained last year. A couple of, about a week into Trump's term, uh, the clock was moved again to two and a half minutes to midnight. That's the closest it's been since 1953. Uh, and that means uh, extermination of the species is very much in, uh, very much an open question. Uh, I don't want to say it's solely the impact of uh, the Republican Party, obviously that's false, but they certainly are in the lead uh, in uh, openly uh, advocating and working for uh, destruction of the human species. I agree that's a very outrageous statement. Uh, so I therefore simply suggest that you take a look at the facts and uh, see if uh, it has any merit or if it just uh, should be bitterly condemned. That's up to you. In my view, the facts are pretty clear. Do you think there is a possibility that the U.S. would attack North Korea? I, I mean, th this administration is extremely unpredictable. Uh, Trump probably has no idea what he's going to do five minutes from now. So you can't really make predictions with much confidence, but I doubt it very much. Uh, the reason is very simple. An attack on North Korea would unleash, uh, no matter what attack it is, even a nuclear attack, would unleash massive artillery bombardment of Seoul, which is the biggest city in South Korea right near the border, uh, which would wipe it out, including uh, plenty of American troops. Uh, would, uh, it doesn't, as far, I mean, I, no technical expert, but as far as I can, as I read and can see, there's no defense against that. Uh, furthermore, North Korea could retaliate against uh, American bases in the region uh, where there's plenty of American soldiers and so on, also in Japan. Uh, they'd be devastated. North Korea would be finished, you know, so would much of the region. Uh, but, they, but if attacked, presumably they would respond, very likely. In fact, the responses might be automatic. Uh, McMaster, at least, and Mattis understand this, uh, how much uh, influence they have, uh, we, we don't know. So I think an attack is unlikely. But the real question is, is there a way of, res of, of dealing with the problem? Uh, there are a lot of proposals, uh, sanctions, uh, uh, big, a new missile defense system, which is a major threat to China, will increase tensions there, uh, 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 military threats of various kinds, uh, uh, sending an aircraft carrier, the Vinson, uh, to North Korea, except by accident it happened to be going in the opposite direction, but we'll forget that. Uh, but uh, these are, uh, uh, those are the proposals, that kind of proposals as to how to solve it. Actually, there's one proposal that's ignored. I mean, you see a mention of it now and then. 
Uh, it's a pretty simple proposal. Remember, the goal is to get North Korea to freeze its weapon systems, weapons and missile systems. So one proposal is to accept their offer to do that. Sounds simple. They've made a proposal, China and North Korea, propose to freeze the North Korean uh, missile and nuclear weapon systems, and the U.S. instantly rejected it. And you can't blame that on Trump. Obama did the same thing a couple of years ago. Same offer was presented, I think it was 2015. The Obama administration instantly rejected it. And the reason is that it calls for a quid pro quo. It says, in return, the United States should put an end to threatening military maneuvers on North Korea's borders, uh, which happen to include, under Trump, uh, sending of uh, uh, nuclear-capable B-52s uh, flying right near the border. Now, maybe Americans don't remember very well, but North Koreans have a memory of uh, not too long ago when North Korea was absolutely flattened, literally, by American bombing. There was, there was, there was literally no targets left. And I really urge people who haven't done it to read the uh, official American military histories, the Air Quarterly Review, the military histories describing this. And what the, they describe it very vividly and accurately. They say there just weren't any targets left. So what can we do? Well, we decided to attack the, bom the dams, the huge dams. That's a major war crime. People were hanged for it at Nuremberg, but put that aside. And then comes an ecstatic, gleeful description of the bombing of the dams and the huge flow of water, which was wiping out valleys and destroying the rice crop on which uh, Asians depend for uh, survival. Lots of racist comment, but all with exaltation and glee. You really have to read it to appreciate it. Uh, the North Koreans don't have to bother reading it. They lived it. So when uh, nuclear-capable uh, B-52s are flying on their border, along with other threatening military maneuvers, they're uh, kind of upset about it. Uh, strange people. And they uh, continue to develop uh, what they see as a potential deterrent that might protect the regime from, uh, and the country, in fact, from uh, destruction. Uh, this has nothing at all to do with what you think about the government. So maybe it's the worst government in human history. Okay. Uh, but these are still the facts uh, that exist. So why is the United States unwilling to accept an agreement which would end the immediate threats of destruction against North Korea? and in return, freeze the weapons and missile systems. Well, I leave that to you. And remember, that's bipartisan in this case. Uh, could, could negotiations go? The usual argument is, well, you can't trust them, and so on and so forth. But there is a history. And I, there's no time to run through the history. It's quite interesting. It begins in 1993, when uh, Clinton, under Clinton, uh, the North Koreans uh, made a deal with Israel to terminate North Korean uh, missile shipments to the Middle East, which is a great, serious threat to Israel and the world. And in return, Israel would recognize North Korea. Uh, the Clinton administration wouldn't accept that. And North Korea responded by uh, ascending by uh, firing their first intermediate range missiles. Uh, I won't go on with the rest. It's a very interesting story. Uh, there was actually an agreement in 2005 that uh, North Korea would completely uh, dismantle its nuclear weapons and missile systems, end them, finish, dismantle them, in return for a non-aggression pact from the United States, uh, an end to threats, uh, provision, by, by the West, that means by the United States, of a, uh, a, 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 a light water reactor, which can't produce nuclear weapons, but could produce, be used for peaceful purposes, research, medical, other purposes. And that was basically the agreement, 2005. 
didn't last very long. The Bush administration instantly undermined it. It dismantled the consortium that was supposed to provide the uh, reactor, and it immediately imposed uh, pressure, and it, when the U.S. pressures, it means it happens, uh, banks to block uh, North Korean financial transactions, including perfectly legitimate trade. So the crazy North Koreans started producing missiles and nuclear weapons again. And that's been the kind of record all the way through. So yeah, maybe the most horrible regime in human history, but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, the regime does want to survive, and it even wants to carry out economic development. There's pretty general agreement about this, which it cannot do at any significant way when it's pouring resources, very scarce resources, into uh, uh, weapons and missile production. So they have considerable incentive, including survival, uh, to perhaps continue this process of reacting uh, in a kind of tit-for-tat fashion to U.S. actions. When the U.S. lowers tensions, they do. When we raise tensions, they go on with these uh, plans. H how about that as a possibility? I mean, it is, if you look at the press, it's occasionally mentioned. Actually, it was not a bad article in the Washington Post about it recently by a U.S. professor who teaches in South Korea. Uh, so occasionally it's this strange possibility of uh, letting the North Koreans do exactly what we want them to do. Uh, sometimes this is mentioned, but it's pretty much dismissed. We can't do that sort of thing. Uh, there are similar questions to raise about Iran. Uh, so Iran is, uh, you know, the... Uh, Again, the adults in the room, like Mattis and so on, say it's the greatest threat to peace, you know, the greatest sponsor of terrorism, on and on. Uh, how is it a sponsor of terrorism? Well, could go through that. So, for example, in Yemen, uh, it's claimed that they are providing some aid to rebel tribesmen, Houthi tribesmen, uh, in Yemen. Okay, maybe they are. Uh, what is the United States doing in Yemen? It's providing a huge flood of arms to its Saudi Arabian ally who are destroying the country, who've created a huge humanitarian crisis. Uh, huge numbers of people killed, massive starvation. They're threatening now to bomb a port, which is the only source of aid for surviving people. But Iran is the major source of terrorism. And if you look around the world, there's many questions like this I don't want to go on too long, but very strikingly, and this, there's one lesson that you discover when you carefully look at the historical record. And what I just described about North Korea is pretty typical. Over and over again, there are possibilities of diplomacy and negotiation which might not succeed. You can't be sure if you don't try them, but which look uh, pretty promising, which are abandoned, dismissed, literally without comment, in favor of increased force and violence. In fact, that's also the background for the 1953 moment uh, when the clock moved to two minutes to midnight and the U.S. faced the first serious threat to its security uh, that, in fact, you know, since probably the War of 1812, uh, could have been avoided. There's pretty good evidence that it could have been avoided, but it was the possibility was literally not even considered. And case after case is like this. It's worth looking at the historical record from that perspective to ask whether that general comment has some validity. I think if you do, you'll find that it has considerable merit. I wanted to turn from North Korea and Iran to Syria. It was the day of the gas attack in Syria, so we didn't get to talk about it very much. And I'm wondering your thoughts on what you think happened and then the ensuing U.S. bombing. There are some things we know for sure. There was a serious uh, chemical uh, weapons attack. Uh, nobody doubts that. It's plausible that it was the Syrian government, uh, which does raise some questions. It's 
not so obvious why the Assad regime would have carried out a chemical warfare attack at a moment when it's pretty much winning the war. And the worst danger it faces is that a counter force will enter uh, to undermine its progress. So it does raise some questions. Uh, it also, uh, uh, even though maybe the, uh, you can think up some reason why the Assad regime, which is a murderous, brutal regime, might have done it, it's e there's even another question as to why the Russians would have allowed it. Now remember, this is a, the air base is a joint Russian-Syrian base. Russia has plenty of clout in Syria. And for them, it's a total disaster. Now, they have global concerns, not just local concerns in Syria. So there are some concerns, and there are further concerns. Uh, there has been, the White House did put out a, uh, a careful analysis, uh, you know, a justification, an intelligence report uh, to explain and account for showing why they had absolute confidence that it was Syrian government attack. Now, this was analyzed closely by a very serious and credible analyst, uh, Theodore Postel, professor at MIT, who has a long record of uh, uh, highly successful, credible uh, analysis. He's a highly regarded uh, uh, st strategic analyst and intelligence analyst. And he gave a pretty devastating critique of the White House report. You might, you can pick it up online and take a look at it. So there certainly are some questions. Uh, that there's that Syria is capable of a monstrous act like that, the Syrian government, that much is not in doubt. But one question that arises is, before doing something, could you find out what happened? Okay, I mean, let's have an inquiry, take a look and see what in fact actually happened. Now, there are plenty of cases where things, where it looked that thing, as though things happened, but they didn't. I remember that report, reporting from Syria is extremely difficult. Uh, if reporters go into the uh, rebel-held areas and don't do what they're told, you know, get your head cut off. Uh, Patrick Coburn and others have written about this. You just can't seriously report from those areas. Uh, there are obvious questions when you're reporting from the government side. So the reporters are, there are very good reporters doing a serious, courageous job, but there's not much you can do. So we just don't know a lot. Uh, well, those are the circumstances in which the 59 Tomahawk missiles were launched. That's pretty easy. It's easy to sit in Washington and push a button and say, go kill somebody. Uh, that's considered courage, you know, man, it's macho, we're showing how strong we are. Uh, what, what did they actually do? Well, apparently the Tomahawk missiles were targeting a part of the airfield that doesn't seem to be used. And in fact, the next day, uh, planes were taking off. And in fact, the village that was attacked by the chemical weapons has been even more heavily attacked by straight bombing from the Assad government after the 59 Tomahawk missiles. So whatever they were intended to do uh, didn't, doesn't seem to have anything to do with Syria. I suspect that what they were intended to do was uh, pretty much what you described, to shore up uh, Trump's image as, uh, I think it was Nikki Haley at the UN said, there's a new sheriff in town. So now we've got, uh, Wyatt Earp, you know, pulling out his gun and getting rid of the bad guys. No, no more of this soft stuff. Uh, so it was probably an attempt to shore up that image. Uh, pretty much like the bomb in Afghanistan. Uh, nobody knows what it was for, what it had to do with. Uh, probably destroyed a large part of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, shortly after that, there was a mass, uh, an incredibly brutal and successful Taliban attack which killed a couple hundred uh, uh, recruits, uh, most of them unarmed, the young draftees didn't know what they were doing. The, it was so bad that the defense minister resigned. Doesn't seem to have any effect on, it was supposedly aimed at ISIS. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Uh, they don't seem to be affected by it. So these look like, there doesn't seem to be any strategic analysis behind 
any of these actions, as far as anyone can tell. They seem like kind of about at the level of the Twitters that keep coming out. It's something that kind of occurs to me, so why not do it? It's cheap, it may kill a lot of people, it makes me look good, and, you know, makes it seem as if I'm defending the country and so on. It's hard to see it as anything but that. Uh, that these things help the people of Syria and Iraq is very hard to imagine. What do you think has to be done to solve the crisis, the humanitarian catastrophe? In, in Syria? Syria? It's a terrible catastrophe. And, you know, unfortunately, there isn't a lot that can be done about it. There are some things that can be done. I mean, the idea that you can send in the Marines and bomb and so on, uh, that has a small problem. If you do, you probably set off a nuclear war. And not only is Syria destroyed, the rest of Syria, but the rest of the world too. So there's a little difficulty in that scenario, uh, whatever one thinks about the justification for it. So what can be done? Well, one thing that can be done, which is really easy, very easy, is to take care of the people fleeing from this disaster. I mean, there are huge numbers of people fleeing from the disaster. What do we do about them? Make sure they don't come here, you know? Kind of like uh, people fleeing from, uh, you know, my relatives, in fact, fleeing, trying to flee from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, uh, under the Nazis, before when the Nazis were coming along. Not, we don't want them, not here, you know? So the Syrians don't come, maybe a tiny trickle, but very few come here. Europe's not that much better, in fact, pretty horrible too. So one thing you could do is just take care of the people who are fleeing the disaster. Another thing you can do is provide humanitarian aid for those in the region. Now, there are countries who are absorbing refugees, remember. Like take Lebanon, it's not a rich country like us, poor country. About 40% of the population are uh, refugees, many of them fleeing from uh, the Israeli wars as far back as 48, and many, a huge number of Syrians. Uh, Jordan, another poor country, has absorbed a huge number of refugees. Uh, Turkey has a couple of million. Uh, Iran has uh, accepted refugees. So there are, very, there are poor countries that are accommodating refugees. Uh, but not the rich countries. Uh, the rich countries, it's not our business, certainly not us. It's even a more serious problem with regard for, with it for us, moral problem with regard to Central America, but let's keep to Syria. So another thing you do is provide badly needed aid and assistance for those who have succeeded in fleeing the disaster or who remain in parts of Syria where survival is possible but are living under horrible conditions. Now that's all cheap and easy. A uh, fra tiny fraction of uh, increasing the military budget to cause more destruction. Now the other thing that can be done and is being done is to try to support local efforts throughout Syria at local ceasefires just to lower the level of violence. Now that's happening in different places. Yeah, maybe the People don't like each other, but people sometimes like to survive. And there are accommodations worked out and they could be helped. A broader possibility is to try to pursue the negotiations that will lead to some kind of diplomatic settlement. Now there have been efforts, but they're, they're mixed. And they're probably, we can't be certain, but there seem to be possibilities that were uh, mit, uh, dismissed so, for example, in 2012, uh, there were reports from uh, uh, former uh, Finnish minister, Ahtisari, has a very credible record of uh, involvement in international peacekeeping, who claimed that, the, uh, one, that, a Republic, that a Russian diplomat had proposed a settlement in which uh, Assad would be eased out in the course of the negotiations and some um, settlement would be reached in which the uh, Assad regime would be ended. Uh, that was apparently dismissed without comment. Uh, the U.S. and 
Britain and France just assumed at that point that uh, uh, they could overthrow the Assad regime. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. And that's the report. Uh, the report appeared in England. As far as I know, it was never even reported here by good reporters. Is it true? Who knows? Got to look into it to find out whether it's true. You have to inquire. You have to pursue the options if they exist. And they weren't. Uh, but th there are things that could be done, not what we would like to see. You know, it would be nice to see here's a solution that will make everybody happy uh, and, and the destruction. But those just don't seem uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the possible agenda uh, because uh, for all kind of reasons, including the uh, threat of uh, very serious war if uh, Russia and the United States don't uh, 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 act in a high level of concert in, uh, uh, in pursuing whatever they may be doing. It looks like now the U.S. is preparing an arrest warrant for Julian Assange. Your thoughts? Well, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, WikiLeaks has released uh, lots of information that governments don't like. It's overwhelmingly information that citizens should have. It's information about what their governments are doing. Uh, and uh, perfectly natural that systems of power uh, uh, don't want to be exposed. So they'll do what they can to prevent exposure. Uh, the, uh, I think it's a disgraceful act. In fact, I think it's uh, disgraceful even to keep uh, Julian Assange uh, holed up in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, he's... Uh, I did visit him there once, but you can guess yourself. It's uh, in many ways worse than imprisonment. At least if you're in prison, you can see other prisoners, and you can get out and look at the sunshine now and then. Uh, he's in a small apartment where you can't go out, you know, can go to the balcony, but that's about it. Uh, a small apartment, uh, basically a couple of rooms inside a small apartment. It's not a big embassy. The embassy is like a kind of an apartment in London, surrounded by police and so on. Uh, th there's been no uh, credible basis for any of this. And uh, to go on to try to carry it, to raise it to the level of uh, criminal prosecutions, I think is, again, one of these efforts to uh, look tough at home. And uh, the kind of effort that a government would carry out that is dedicated to trying to protect itself from exposure of facts that citizens should have, uh, but citizens of power don't want them to have. I think that's the crucial issue. The suggestions are it has to do with um, his aiding and abetting perhaps Chelsea Manning and also Edward Snowden. If, if the charge is true, he should be honored for it. Uh, Chelsea Manning and uh, Edward Snowden are carried out uh, heroic, courageous acts. They fulfilled the responsibility of somebody who takes citizenship seriously. That is, who believes that the people of a country ought to know something about what their government's up to. Okay? Like if their government is carrying out murderous, uh, brutal attacks in Iraq, people should know about it. Takes us back to Martin Luther King's talk in 1967. If uh, the government is, uh, and corporations too, incidentally, are uh, listening in to your uh, telephone conversations and uh, what you're doing, you know, uh, tapping this dis discussion and so on, we should know about it. Uh, governments have no right to do things like that. And people should know about it. And if they think it's okay, fine, let them decide, not do it in secret. And I think people wouldn't agree to it. Uh, that's why it's kept secret. Why else keep it secret? You know? And these are people who exposed it at great risk to themselves. So those are heroic, courageous acts. If uh, WikiLeaks was abetting them, more power to them. That's what they should be doing. Can you assess, as the media assesses President Trump in his first 100 days, the media's behavior. Well, I think the media has 
fallen over backwards to try to give him some protection and leeway. I mean, uh, you know, there are things that are so ludicrous and outrageous that uh, a, a reporter simply can't uh, uh, keep from saying something about them. Like there's one ridiculous claim after another that comes out of the tweets, you know, uh, three million illegal uh, undocumented refugees uh, voted for Clinton, uh, uh, Obama uh, wiretapped the Trump Tower, you know, one after another. Uh, my sense is, this is just a guess, that this is a media strategy, that it's the Bannon, uh, Trump, um, Spicer strategy to try to keep attention focused on one or another form of lunacy, uh, but not look at what's actually happening. Now, what's actually happening is that Paul Ryan and his associates behind the scenes are systematically and carefully dismantling every element of government that is of any benefit to people and that doesn't maximize corporate power and profit. I mean, the dedication of the Republican leadership, especially the Ryan-type leadership, their dedication to slavish servility to corporate power and wealth is just phenomenal. I mean, read this morning's business pages. Uh, their latest uh, step is to try to prevent exposure of complaints against uh, banks that carry out uh, improper activities. It is possible now, thanks to the Consumer Protection Act, for people to uh, uh, criticize when they think a bank has carried out uh, some improper activity. But we've got to keep that silent, you know, because we have to protect uh, corporations from any exposure of criminal activities they might carry out. I mean, down to that level, in fact, everywhere you look, I mean, the health care proposal was so shocking that uh, um, it was a proposal basically to cut taxes for the rich and to ensure that poor and middle class people, people who voted for Trump, in fact, don't get medical aid. Uh, as you saw, of course, the Congressional Budget Office estimated uh, 24 million additional people uh, uninsured. There was an analysis of that by uh, 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 Steffi Woolhandler and David Himmelstein, two health specialists, uh, uh, just studying the relationship between lack of insurance and deaths. There's plenty of evidence about that. And it turns out that would have meant about uh, 45,000 additional deaths a year. But well, that's okay as long as you cut taxes for the rich. Uh, and step by step, that's what's happening behind the facade of uh, uh, Trumpisms and uh, you know Spicer uh, antics before the press. And the press is pretty much falling for it. That's what they focus on, not what's being carried out. Uh, there is, of course, criticism, mild criticism of outrageous lies, but I think that just plays the game. That's what the lies are for. Then you can yell about the liberal press that is trying to undermine us. It's all a kind of a desperate effort to keep a con game going. Uh, Trump does have a base, a voter base, He's kicking them in the face with abandon. And the idea is, how do you hold on to them while you're doing this? Not an easy trick. And this, I think, is part of the con. And uh, there are people in the press who are pointing it out, uh, Paul Krugman for one, but uh, nothing like it, it should be. Ten principles of the concentration of power and wealth, how it's happening, what to watch out for. Well, credit for the 10 principles goes, should go to the producers of the film. Uh, what they did was uh, take a lot of uh, interviews and discussions about all sorts of things and put them in a, a coherent and uh, I think pretty effective form, including formulating 
10 principles, that's their contribution, uh, and uh, including uh, material that discusses them. And you can look at the film and see, or the book, but my feeling is they did a really good job. I'm so the book is accompanying this film that is now yeah. out on Netflix. Principle one, reducing democracy. Principle two, shaping ideology. And principle three, redesigning the economy. Well, all of those fall together, and they're part of a pretty remarkable development that's taking place in, actually in human history. Uh, humans in the last 60 or 70 years have succeeded in creating a kind of a perfect storm, literally. Uh, two, there's a kind of a pincers uh, uh, movement that we've created. Uh, two major attacks on the prospects for survival. Uh, global, global warming, nuclear weapons, uh, the Anthropocene, the nuclear age. And the third is a set of socioeconomic policies designed to undermine the possibility of dealing with the problems. The problems could be dealt with only in a functioning democracy of engaged, uh, informed people who could make decisions, who would be informed and could make decisions to deal with the crises. But the so-called neoliberal programs of the past generation, you know, sort of somewhat market-oriented programs designed to undermine the institutions, the governmental and popular institutions that might deal with these issues, it's all a unit. Uh, one result is uh, a very significant decline in democracy. Uh, you can see it in the, it's, which is almost built into the policies. It's perfectly built. You can't carry out economic policies of the type that have been, uh, that, are, that have been implemented in the past generation in a functioning democracy. That's impossible. Let me just take a look at the numbers. Uh, so uh, uh, the neoliberal programs were basically taking off uh, right around 1980, it escalated, started a little with the late Carter, escalated under Reagan, went on more under Clinton and so on. Uh, 2007 was the peak of supposed success. This is right before the crash. A lot of euphoria among uh, economists, political analysts about uh, the great achievements of uh, neoclassical economics, of, uh, of the great moderation, the, you know, the, the neoliberal programs, uh, uh, dismantling of regulations, all these great successes. 2007, uh, what was happening to American working people at that time? In 2007, wages, real wages, were lower than they had been in 1979 when the experiment took off. In fact, for the majority of the population, it's a period of stagnation or decline. Uh, benefits have declined. Uh, people had been, uh, some of the reasons were explained by uh, 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 Alan Greenspan, head of the Federal Reserve, who was in charge pretty much of managing the economy. He testified to Congress that part of the success of the economy, the low inflation and so on, was due to what he called growing worker insecurity. People, working people were insecure. They were intimidated. They knew they, that they were in a dangerous situation, precarious situation. As a result, they didn't uh, press for increase in wages and for decent wages and benefits. Uh, they were willing to accept, in fact, an effective decline in their living standards. And Greenspan, who was a close observer of the economy, pointed out that this continued even when jobs were increasing in the late Clinton period. It was deeply embedded in the nature of the policies being carried out that working people are intimidated, they're living precarious lives, uh, many of them are part-time, they're losing security, their unions are being destroyed, and their wages are declining. So it's all great. The economy is wonderfully healthy. 
Can you carry out policies like that in a democracy? I mean, are people going to vote for it? Same in Europe, even worse in many ways. Uh, the so-called austerity programs, uh, e even the economists of the international, like the IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, their own economists uh, say, report that these policies make no economic sense. But the IMF bureaucrats, the ones who are part of the decision-making apparatus, they vote for them. Uh, how do you, and the effect on Europe is the same thing. As far as democracy is concerned, just like in the United States, there's anger, contempt for major for centrist, for, you know, for the major governing institutions. Uh, here it's Congress, there it's the, the political parties. You just saw it in France yesterday. Uh, the two major parties were barely visible in the election, and it's happening all over Europe, the same kind of thing that's happening here. I mean, here it's uh, happening in a way which is uh, almost uh, farcical uh, because of the, uh, uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, actions carried out by the leadership. In Europe, it's being, uh, it's being pursued in a way which is really ominous. I mean, you don't have to look far back to find a time when uh, fascist parties actually had power in Europe, and we know what happened. And now there are neo-fascist parties with fascist roots often, which are pretty close to power, uh, even in places like Austria and Germany, which have some memories about. Uh, France as well was, uh, under the Nazis, was a very pro-Nazi country, the Vichy government, was rounding up Jews faster than the Germans wanted them. A really ugly record. And seeing these things come back, or just seeing a situation in which According to recent polls, a majority of Europeans think there should be no more Muslims in Europe. I mean, that evokes some memories, not nice ones. And a lot of, you can't attribute it all to the neoliberal economic policies, but a lot of it does follow from that. When you impose on people circumstances of this kind, you have to make sure that they have no, uh, no way of responding politically. In Europe, it's done pretty straightforwardly. Uh, the main decisions about socioeconomic policies are made by the so-called Troika, IMF, uh, European Central Bank, and the European Commission, which is unelected. So three unelected bodies, they make the decisions. Uh, they do listen to voices, the voices of the northern banks, mostly German banks, and the people suffer. And they get, they're angry, uh, frightened, uh, often reacting in dangerous ways. We see similar phenomena here. So to go back to the pincers movement, what's happened is we've created two huge threats to survival. We have systematically, not you and me, but the leadership has systematically created socioeconomic policies, which have as a consequence, almost immediate consequence, the undermining of functioning democracy, uh, the one thing that might deal with the disasters. Like I said, it's kind of perfect storm. Real credit to the human species to have contrived something like this. Principle four is shift the burden onto the poor and the middle classes. Principle five, attack the solidarity of the people. Six, let special interests run the regulators. Seven, engineer election results. Eight, use fear and power of the state to keep the rabble in line. Is it necessary to comment? Nine is manufacture consent and principle 10 is marginalize the population. Well, in fact, that's exactly what's happening. And it's the, and there's a reason for it. You cannot carry out the kinds of policies that have been developed in the last generation and have the population function democratically. In Europe, you can't get people to vote for policies which are undermining their lives, which are a limit, which are leaving especially younger people without any hopes of decent employment, uh, which are driving people to precarious existences, 
which are undermining wages, reducing benefits in England, uh, right now uh, undermining, threatening uh, what had been the world's most, by far the world's most effective and efficient national health system. You can't get people to vote for things like this. So what you have to do is marginalize them in one way or another, turn them against each other, uh, aim, turn their anger against vulnerable people. That's a standard technique. Get people to, uh, don't look at the people who are really doing this to you. Look at the ones who are more vulnerable, uh, immigrants, uh, the poor, you know, Muslims, blacks, anybody. Uh, we're familiar with that too. There's not a slight history about it. So sure, that just, it's like a, it's like an almost logical consequence of the socioeconomic policies which have been imposed and lauded, in fact, by elites, including liberal elites. Well, a lot of this was done, let's say, by the Clinton administration. That's what was held, the uh, deregulation, for example, uh, which immediately, very quickly led to one after another financial crisis. Uh, that was initiated by uh, liberal economists who are telling us how wonderful it is. And there's actually a, you know, a theory, a neocla neoclassical economic theory, which says, yeah, it's fine. Actually, there were people who warned against it. There were people who knew, uh, a lot of left in independent economists, but even people right out of the mainstream, like uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, uh, back around uh, 1995 or so, he wrote an article uh, actually in a World Bank research journal in which he warned against what he called uh, the religion that the market knows best. He says, that's the religion, as he put it, that's being followed by economists. And he says, you gotta take a look at that religion. It, like a lot of religions, it just doesn't work. Uh, economic history, uh, and even logic show us lots of things that are wrong about it, but that was pursued with uh, abandon on the basis of theories of uh, efficient markets, uh, you know, rational behavior, uh, rational expectations, and so on, uh, none of which had any empirical basis or founding. Uh, but they were the, ex the doctrines were accepted for the very simple reason that they were highly beneficial to wealth and power. And that makes them acceptable. And you get the results that you have. The undermining of the only means possible to try to deal with the existential crises that we have created. So again, it's a kind of perfect storm. Part, all sorts of sources, including just socioeconomic policies, of a bipartisan nature. Do you think fascism is rising in the United States? I think there's a danger of fascism in Europe, but I don't think that it's, for one, you have to be a little bit careful about that. I mean, if you're a black kid in the ghetto, yeah, you can say it kind of looks like fascism. But for most of the country, most of us, like people like us, there aren't stormtroopers in the streets. There's no fascist political party. There's no ideology of fascism. Uh, the Trump ideology reduces to pretty much me, you know, not fascism, whatever you think it is. Uh, so there's, there are serious dangers, uh, but, but I think fascism in a way gives it too much credit. It makes it look like more of a well-formulated ideology than it actually is. I think what we're seeing are the desperate efforts to try to hold together rising uh, disasters uh, that for which the means have been undermined. Oh, there's a lot of reasons for hope. Uh, first of all, there is uh, enormous resistance, uh, the kind of thing that's happened sometimes before, like in the early 80s when there was huge public opposition, enormous public opposition to the uh, uh, dangerous uh, increase in nuclear weapons development. And it had an effect. Like I mentioned that the bullet of atomic scientists a couple of years ago, doomsday clock, went to three minutes to midnight. That's the closest it had been since 1984, when there was a major war threat with the uh, increase in 
uh, nuclear weapons threats. And it was significantly attenuated by popular action. And then, of course, there was the activism of the 60s and the 70s. It didn't end in the 60s by any means. So some of the most effective uh, popular movements with the biggest impact on the society uh, are really developed in the 70s, like the women's movement. Uh, the environmental movements and so on. The seeds were in the 60s, but they weren't there yet. They were just barely beginning. Uh, all of that has really civilized the society, had lots of positive effects, and it goes on right to the present. So the most, I think, the most significant fact about the last election uh, it was not Trump's victory, which was very serious for the country and the world, but the uh, astonishing success of uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign. It's worth remembering that that broke with over 100 years of U.S. political history. Uh, U.S. elections are pretty much bought. You can predict with remarkable precision electoral outcomes by looking at simple measures like campaign funding. There's very serious work on this. Uh, the main person who many of you know is uh, Tom Ferguson, political scientist at UMass, done really good work on this. And it's very impressive work. You can almost predict uh, the outcome of an electoral campaign, president, House, Senate, just by looking at campaign funding. And of course, that's a predictor of policy as well. And that's been well known, you know, from way back among uh, uh, people who run campaigns, and by now the evidence is overwhelming. So what did Sanders do? Had no corporate support, no support from the wealthy, no support from the media, which mostly either dismissed or denigrated him. Uh, unknown person, nobody had ever heard of him. Uh, he was proposing, what about uh, New Deal policies? Uh, by contemporary U.S. standards, that's what he called, with some justice, a political revolution. Actually, the policies he proposed, it wouldn't have surprised Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, he, he favored similar policies, by and large. In fact, he even said that uh, anyone who doesn't accept uh, New Deal programs just doesn't belong in our political system. He was a strong supporter of unions and so on. Uh, we've come quite a ways since then. But Sanders was a voice going back to the period when there was very rapid growth, egalitarian growth, uh, the serious beginnings of an attack on some of the deep crimes of the country that go way back, like uh, the racist crimes and others. Then came the 60s, the big civilizing effect, their consequences, then a regression, the regression of the last 30, 40 years, the neoliberal programs and all their consequences. And then without, but not ending activism by any means. There was plenty of activism on uh, Central America solidarity movements, for example, uh, which was quite effective. But Sanders broke with over a century of history. That's pretty serious. And it's having an effect. Uh, Fox News informed us should thank them for that. They did a poll of uh, uh, popularity of political figures. Uh, how much do you like various political figures? Uh, one person was way in the lead, uh, Bernie Sanders, far above anyone else, uh, even higher among young people. Those are pretty serious achievements. And there's a lot to build on there. And in fact, out of the Sanders popular movement, there are developments growing, which I think are quite constructive and are uh, coalescing and integrating with many other things that are happening. So there are plenty of grounds for hope, but the, we are in an extremely dangerous situation. It's not, I mean, some of it, let me, if there's a little time, just go on with something that isn't reported and is extremely serious. Uh, last January, a couple of weeks into the a week or so into the Trump term, the uh, minute hand was moved to two and a half minutes to midnight. But since then, uh, we have learned things 
which I suspect would lead the same group of analysts to push it even closer to midnight. Uh, what did we learn? Not that you read about it in the press, but what did you learn if you looked at what's happening? Well, there was an extremely important article that appeared in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is the main scientific journal that deals with uh, nuclear and other strategic issues. Uh, what it discussed was the nuclear modernization programs that were initiated by Obama and are being carried forward more under Trump. And it pointed out it's a technical article, but basically what it pointed out is that these modernization programs had already increased the kill capacity, the destructive capacity of the U.S. nuclear weapon systems by a large factor, by maybe a factor of three. Enough, they said, to completely wipe out the Russian deterrent. Okay. It's not that the Russians don't know this. Uh, Russia does not have our sophisticated early warning systems, satellite warning systems. They have much more primitive ones. They don't get much advanced warning of an alleged attack. There have been many close calls in the past because of this. Well, now they're aware that the U.S. modernization programs are able to completely wipe out their deterrent because we've so expanded already our destructive capacity by a huge factor. Uh, what, and as they point out in the article, this means that the system of stability by which the world has been kind of hanging by a thread, a pretty slender thread, it's being seriously threatened. Means that in the event of some rising tension, and there's plenty of tensions at the Russian border, not at the Mexican border, at the Russian border, plenty of them and plenty of provocations, uh, they might just out of desperation uh, decide, well, we better launch a preemptive strike or we're gone. We don't have a deterrent. Now, that's what's being developed. It's another great contribution of human intelligence to develop means to make our own destruction far more likely. Now, that's, what's been, that's what we've learned in the last couple of months. These should be screaming headlines all over the place, uh, just like the, uh, there should be uh, headlines about uh, the Republican Party trying to destroy the prospects for organized human life. Uh, that's what journalism would be if it were concerned with bringing to people the things that are significant uh, for people who live in a democratic society, who can make decisions about how to deal with the problems they face in their lives. Uh, almost nothing about it. It's not a secret. You know, it's not classified. You can find out about it. It's a free country in that respect, an important respect. You should respect and honor that. Uh, but uh, these are the things that are happening right now. And it means that the sledgehammers that we've constructed in our brilliance uh, to threaten our survival are getting far more dangerous while the political mechanisms that might lead to a sensible reaction are being destroyed. And we see the impact in the rise of uh, anger, uh, uh, contempt for institutions, uh, 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 irrational reactions, uh, the kinds of things, uh, scapegoating, you know, things that are pretty dangerous. We've, again, constructed a remarkable, perfect storm.